so usually I teach this class the uh, uh, human information interaction. And um, uh, when I first came to SILS in 1998, uh, this was uh, had a different title. It was uh, more of a communication course. And over the years, it's evolved. Uh, and at first, this, this notion of information interaction kind of bothered me. What does that really mean, to interact with information? And so um, one of the things that I've developed over the years is a, a way to address that question. And um, uh, that's the main goal for today. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, some basic information uh, concepts. We'll move from those information concepts uh, to um, talk about how that differs from communication and, and then the need, the need for interaction. And uh, close with um, uh, what I, I think is kind of a sweet spot for information in library science and uh, what, uh, why I think this course is a good way to uh, address that sweet spot. Okay, so uh, to begin, um, let's uh, think about some of the senses of information. What does that word mean to you when you hear information? Um, many people have tried to... I, I don't know if I'll mess up the phone, but is it possible uh, to turn off some of the lights? Sure. Yeah. Can you change... Can you close the... Excuse me. How's that? Can you close the phone Oh, that's better. Thank you. So classically, uh, there have been sort of three senses of information, and so uh, Michael Buckland has written about this, as have many other people. I like uh, the way Buckland uh, does this. Uh, he distinguishes information as thing, as process, and as mental state. And I'd like to add a fourth sense of information uh, uh, that I call a reflection of self in cyberspace. Um, what, uh, what, what Buckland did in one of his books was to talk about these three kinds of, of information senses, and he put them on a two-dimensional uh, kind of uh, 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 framework that had uh, uh, sort of nouns and verbs, if you will, uh, the things that were either processes uh, or objects, and uh, things that were either physical or ephemeral. And um, I, that sort of works uh, for me as well, but um, uh, I'm going to use a little bit different uh, kind of approach. So we're all familiar with information as thing. These are the objects that we usually think of as information. If you stop someone on the street, this is what, uh, and you said, what's information? They might say, well, a book or a newspaper or uh, a message that I uh, got via email or what have you. Now, when we get to bits, it gets a little bit kind of blurry, though, because bits are also energy. Uh, and so, um, the noun part of it becomes a little less clear in the digital realm. <coughs> Keep that in mind because that's going to be one of the learning conditions we'll get to in a, in a bit. Um, another sense of, of information is the actual process, the act of informing. Uh, the sort of, and this is actually where the word comes from. Uh, the etymology of the word uh, is sort of the forming in the mind of another. You're, you're, you're changing someone else's mind by informing them forming something in their mind. So this is the verb sense of information, and this was the original meaning of the word. Uh, the third uh, state uh, or sense of, of information is as a mental state. It's what's inside the, uh, your head. It's, it's a kind of a knowledge in the head. It's, it's, a, in, in, uh, uh, it's a state of uh, being, if you will. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a type of, a special kind of verb. Now. Um, this fourth kind is something that uh, I've been quite interested in for uh, the last decade or so as it looked at how the, uh, the, the digital realm has begun to influence how we think about information in, in our world. And so uh, I'm, you know, there's a whole series of lectures on this, but uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of try and summarize it quickly. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a term I call proflection. This is a corruption or a combination of two terms projection and reflection. The idea is that as we work in um, uh, to today's world, much of what we do is to project ourselves consciously. So if you meet someone, you project through your mannerisms, the clothes you wear, or the speech, and all, all of that. And, and you know, we have lots of good visceral experience with this, and we know how to act with other people. When we work in cyberspace, though, it's quite different. Uh, you, know, you might be on email, and next moment you're on a blog, and next moment you're on a website, and what's, what's actually leaving you 
uh, is, is, is some information about yourself, your own behaviors. But it's all kind of m mashed together. You know, we don't normally think, oh, I'm in email now, I need to act this way, uh, and I'm going to type with this kind of, of uh, um, uh, rhythm, as opposed to when I'm clicking uh, through a website, I'm going to click on this website differently than I click on that website uh, because I want to act differently, more formally, or, or project a different image. So it's all kind of blurred together as, as one kind of, of uh, behavior. Uh, so our projections leave in cyberspace exo information, information that leaves us. And in fact, um, many companies today depend uh, their, uh, on their very business uh, models for these reflections of ourselves. So every mouse click you make, every uh, time you are doing a Google search and you have a click stream pattern behind you, Google is, is leveraging that to make money because they're able to charge the, adverti the uh, advertising fees based upon what kinds of click patterns occur. Uh, Amazon is able to make money by taking whatever you do and leveraging that to uh, make recommendations so that uh, maybe other people will buy a book or, or some product uh, because you did. Now, it's not you personally, it's you in aggregate with many, many other kinds of, of excellent information, but some of us are a little bit concerned about the fact that a lot of this actually is very, very personal. And in fact, could be traced back to you as an individual. Last year when uh, America Online uh, released uh, their uh, search logs, uh, very temporarily, there was a big uh, furor uh, that uh, came about as a result. And uh, it became pretty clear that um, uh, if you had logs, even anonymized logs, so that you, there was no identifying information in terms of the IP address or name, you could still pretty much identify anybody if you could get 200 of their queries. So uh, just the kinds of things you search for is going to lead to you. Uh, and and um, uh, so this is what one of the things that makes these, pro, uh, these uh, projections that we consciously push out into space, we should be thinking about this a little bit more um, intensely. That's okay, I think we have control over that and we eventually will get control over that. If you look at what's going on just in the Facebook, uh, uh, the students who sort of started their Facebook uh, profiles early on, yeah, I didn't care much about privacy. That's changed even over the last year, right? So that, and there's more consciousness about this. The second thing though is less under our control and these are the reflections of ourselves <coughs> in cyberspace. And what do we mean by the reflections? Well, it could be that somebody posts something about you. You might know about that, or you might never see it, because it's a big place out there in cyberspace, right? And so uh, some of this is, is generated by other people, commenting on your blog or uh, uh, on, on something you said or something you wrote, something you did. Taking your, a Flickr picture uh, of you across the room uh, and, and putting it up on Flickr and then um, yeah, sort of annotating it, um, you know, the big the big mouth jerk across the way, right? And you may or may not ever see that. Um, that's, again, um, problematic, but maybe sort of handleable because, you know, we could probably send out our own crawlers to find out, you know, where are all the postings on Flickr that have my name? You know, and go kind of uh, find them. What we do about that is a different issue. But these are reflections of us out in, in, in cyberspace. Now, there's, there's, a, there's a different sort of uh, reflection that is actually much more, uh, I think, impactful. And that's the reflections that are, are made by machines. And there's a lot of machine cycles out there, a lot more machine cycles than there are human cycles. And they're all out there trying to figure out how to connect all of your actions and all of the things that, are, 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 uh, that you do or are about you together somehow so that somebody can get some money from you, mainly. Uh, or maybe just to understand uh, the way life works. Uh, sort of more noble cause. Right? But nonetheless, there are an enormous number of machine cycles out there that are dedicated to creating these reflections of individuals in cyberspace. You put these things together, the projections you're pushing out purposefully or not so purposefully through the exo information, and the reflections that other people and these machines are creating of you, and we now have this kind of new senses of identity, new um, 
information resources that are out there in cyberspace that we didn't have before. We always had public relations, and so the people who were sort of, uh, uh, you know, stars uh, would, would sort of hire people to, to shape the projections, but the reflections are really beyond their control. Question? But, I mean, I, that is a good way of, of bringing cyberspace into it, but I would also say, I mean, why couldn't you, everything you just described for that fourth element really fit under, say, thing and object? I mean, you're, you know, that your your searching info is bits. I mean, which you mentioned, your, you know, your email is written the written word. Um, I think that what's different is that it's not static like the things. It's constantly evolving and changing, and at any given instant. Uh, only portions of it get revealed. So it's, it's a much more dynamic uh, sort of a thing. It's not really a thing. It, 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 um, it's sort of like, like we are. We're organisms, right? And, and so we're never exactly the same. We're always continually evolving and changing. And you know, those changes might be quite small, but uh, it's, it's, it's much more dynamic. And I think that's, that's really the, the main distinction. <clears throat> so these are the different ways that we've classically thought about uh, sort of information. Now, communication is another important term that uh, we often use, and sometimes communication and information are almost used uh, synonymously. I'd like to suggest that that's really not the case if you think about those different senses of, of, of information. Only one of them was kind of the communication sense. So communication is a process, and it involves two or more, and I think of it as human participants, you, I know you want to say you can talk to your dog and your cat and they can talk to you and, and okay, that's fine. But mainly when we talk about communication, we're talking about people uh, uh, communicate with one another. I actually don't think machines communicate with each other or communicate with us. Um, one we usually call a sender, one a receiver uh, at that, or a creator and an audience. Um, the sender the, is an initiator uh, or the creator has some sort of intention in order for it to be communication. It's not just random stuff that you're just pushing out there. Uh, the receiver's mental state changes. So for it to be communication, in the receiver something has to happen that changes them. Okay? Maybe only a little bit, but they have to have some change there. Uh, the time ranges here go from immediate, real time, to infinite. You know, that's why scholarly communication is, uh, you know, lives beyond our, our, our lifetimes because uh, you create something that communicates far into the future. And so Shakespeare is still communicating to us uh, through his writing. Um, it might be unidirectional. It's, it doesn't always uh, certainly have to be, but it, 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 we want to admit the possibility of it just going to, uh, there's no, no feedback cycle. Um, and it requires some sort of medium. Uh, to transmit uh, the, the message. And the messages or objects themselves have sort of two, there are two, a couple of ways to think about them. We can think of them as the conceptual, in the conceptual way, this is the work, as Buckland would call it, the actual, the ideas, the, uh, the um, uh, behind the actual representations, and then the physical, the object itself, how it's actually represented and expressed, uh, and that requires some sort of coding schema. Okay, so these are the, the sort of high level um, characteristics of communication. Now, what's been happening, it seems to me, is that we have this digital representation blur. Uh, this has caused the boundaries between these different senses of information and, in fact, between information and communication to begin to break down a bit. Um, this is due to several factors. First of all, time. We can transfer this stuff like instantly. And in fact, you can transfer huge amounts of it instantly through networking, right? So that makes a big difference. Malleability, you can edit this stuff quite easily. It can be changed. And in fact, knowing that it's been changed or, or not is an extremely important kind of proposition. So something that you've written as a, say, legal uh, uh, document, and somebody inserts a not in the right spot, and it's changed pretty dramatically, and that can make a really, really big difference, right? Uh, it's a lot harder to do when it's a physical document that uh, uh, to, uh, you can sort of pass along. It, when it's a, a, a um, digital document, the, the editability of it uh, makes it uh, a little more fragile in some ways. Um, replicability. It's easy to copy this stuff. And so you can send a copy of whatever you've produced to a million people quite easily. Spammers do it all the time. Uh, it, ha it has the possibility of including behavior. 
And by behavior, uh, I mean it's programmable, that digital objects actually can behave differently depending on conditions. There can be conditional set so that the way some object interacts with you or you interact with it might be different than the way it interacts or people interact with uh, 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 a different person interacts with it. And this is actually, it seems subtle, but it's actually quite important uh, for ha be, having something that's dynamic in this, in this way. Um, the, the result here is that information has become more interactive because of all of these things. And our human experience the sort of old brainness that we are, are really strongly bound by is that uh, is, is related to interactions with people or animals, things that are alive. We don't think about interacting with a rock. I mean, you can pick it up and throw it or, you know, do things, but, you know, it's not quite the same sort of thing uh, as these new sorts of objects, these new information objects that are coming into the world, ranging from web pages to um, second life scenarios to immersive environments of virtual reality or augmented reality to high-end 3D uh, simulations. These are all things that we actually <coughs> interact with like they're people, but they're not. So this is one of the reasons why information interaction has begun over the years to make sense to me as not just this odd conjunction of these two terms, but something that actually makes a lot of sense. A couple words about interaction itself. So I, I, I told you that commu uh, communication was a process. Well, interaction is a process. It involves many of the same sort of things with a few subtle differences. First of all, um, there needs to be some sort of um, multiple parties involved, right? It's mutual, it's reciprocal uh, uh, sort of action. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an activity. Uh, these objects do not have to be people. So we can talk about chemicals interacting, no problem with that. Right? We're not so interested in that, at least in our field, we're, we're mainly concerned with one of those uh, actors being a human being and the other being some sort of information resource. Uh, either may initiate, and, and this could be random, as communication, I said it had to be intentional if you really want to call it communication. The states of both objects change. In the communication sense, uh, I remember I said it could be unidirectional, that you're just pushing stuff out, you really don't want to get anything back. Uh, whereas here, uh, both of the objects are, are actually changing. Um, the time ranges are actually um, um, more interesting as well, or different. They, they can range to from zero to in, infinite, but most of the time we're talking about very quick um, uh, uh, latencies here that that we're having back and forth in a very very short amount of time rather than I write this thing you know, three years later it, it shows up in press you know two years later somebody reads it and sends me a letter right? this is stuff that's happening uh, bang 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 in seconds or or, or minutes uh, or days rather than those longer time periods in general um, and it's always bidirectional there has to be feedback and in fact Typically, that feedback is very quick, so that we have these very short cycles, interaction cycles, and usually we're talking about multiple cycles. Oops. So there's some related concepts that you hear people talk about uh, with uh, information, and so information is kind of in the middle here. Uh, there's the notion of a signal. A signal is, is uh, some sort of um, uh, mass or energy, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a perturbation in, in the environment. Uh, data actually is more than just those sort of random mass and energy in the environment. It's, it's ordered. There's something ordered here. It doesn't have to be a lot, but it's, there's got to be some sort of coding or some sort of ordering that takes place for us to call it data, uh, rather than just you know, these flashes of light uh, that come from the stars. Um, information now, is where it starts to get a little sticky, is data, but the purists would say that it's data that's in a human's head. 
Um, that's a little strong, and I think most people today, and I would agree with, the, with this, uh, admit the possibility of information existing in computers and machines. Certainly we know, we talk about information in cells, right? Intercellular communication among ion uh, 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 ions uh, moving through channels uh, to um, um, you know, create uh, biological processes. Um, there's a little bit of an inflation here, what we used to call data processing, we now call information processing. But information is usually more than data, and it's usually related to some sort of interpretation or human processing. Now, as we move, move up the chain here, we get to knowledge, uh, and we even have knowledge management systems, um, which is truly inflated. Um, and the idea with knowledge is that not only is there more of it, but there are many more connections. It's structured, it's formalized, <clears throat> and it involves activities and skills as well as the actual um, uh, sort of information objects. So it's how to do things uh, uh, that, that would, would fit in here as well. And again, traditionally, this would be mentally represented. But I think, especially in, in the library sense, over time, people have talked about libraries as repositories of knowledge. Well, where's the knowledge? So you pick up the book. Is that the knowledge? Now, if you really want to push on that, I doubt it. Now, if you said, here is the entire collection related to chemistry and the indexing language associated with chemistry and a sort of table of contents or map of how the different branches of, chem of chemistry fit together. Now you're probably talking about something that might be considered knowledge. But from a human point of view, knowledge is really not just a bunch of facts, but how these facts fit together, how they get interpreted, who are the important players, when did different things happen, there's spatial, temporal uh, uh, kinds of relationships that, and it's about the relationships really, that connect these things together that I think makes, makes things uh, knowledge. So people talk about knowledge management systems um, and um, uh, you, know, you, you need to take that with a kind of a grain of salt because if they're talking about that without having a bunch of humans involved, then it's probably a pretty naive view of knowledge management. Now, finally, what we all want is wisdom. And thankfully, no one so far is claiming to have created a wisdom management system. And that's when I will definitely either my head will explode or I'll have to retire. <laughs> but wisdom is, is, is really different. There's all sorts of things that had nothing to do with any of these things that what we would call um, uh, wisdom and, 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 and includes. The simplest way to think about it is it's the, it's the experience to know the differences about, that, that exist here. Would expert systems be leaning closer to wisdom? Absolutely not. No? Expert systems are about here in my okay. Because basically what you're, you're doing, and they're, they're getting closer to knowledge because you're, you, what you have is a whole set of rules, and you have a database of, of events or objects, and the rules fire according to the objects, and you can actually explicate that uh, back to the user. And, and that's, that's not wisdom at all. I mean, it, wisdom includes intuition, it includes lots of experience, it, uh, it includes, uh, it has uh, really nothing to do with education. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's not what we do here. I mean, hopefully, we're all acquiring wisdom as we go along, but um, uh, I, don't, I don't think that um, uh, we can sort of teach wisdom. It, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's strictly human. Um, I used to argue that knowledge was strictly human, but uh, I guess I can give up on some of that as well. Um, um, because, in, indeed, uh, if, you, if you agree that a library properly conceived or a sub-collection sub sub of a library is you know, a knowledge base, you know, I, can, I can live with that. So, um, 
The, another concept that occurs a lot when we talk about information is, is, the, the, is the medium, or, or the plural media. Uh, these are the forms of representation. And it seems to me there's kind of a hierarchy or a, a continuum of, um, of kinds of representations. Statistics are actually probably the most highly coded so you look at this, uh, this table, and in the cell, it has seven. What does that mean? Uh, well, you have to look at the column heading and the row heading to begin to understand what it means. You need a lot of metadata to, to unpack that seven and, 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 and um, uh, attach the meaning to it. So this is really highly coded stuff. Text. Also very highly coded. How long did it take you to learn how to read and write? Lots of years. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a really complicated coding, decoding sort of, of, of process. Um, and we don't need quite as much metadata it's because it's sort of self-describing, but that's because we've spent so much time to be able to read and write. Um, images and sound, music, for example, are more visceral. You don't have to spend in an, very much time at all to perceive an image or hear um, uh, a, a, um, a set of chords. I mean, it's, clearly, you want to be trained to actually appreciate that in a more deep way, but Young children can pretty quickly recognize dog. They see the, the picture of the dog. That's a dog. You don't have to go through, you know, three years of uh, primary education uh, to sort of decode that D O G. Each of those characters put together in this word somehow relate that to this concept of dog. Okay, so these are require actually less metadata and less kinds of skills. And when we get to video, then it's even richer and more visceral. And virtual reality, supposedly, and, and if you get a chance uh, to go over to the computer science department here and, look, and, and participate in some of the uh, VR demos, it is astounding how real it is. Uh, it, it, you, uh, the one I like is the pit. Uh, uh, I could not walk across the pit, even though I knew there was not a pit, 20-foot pit there. You, you look, and you can't do it. And um, it, it, uh, it's extremely um, powerful to, to uh, be in these virtual environments. Um, doesn't require much metadata at all, because it's sort of right there. You get it. Your body gets it. Uh, augmented reality, which is laying over the reality you're in with some virtual kinds of, of evidence. And so usually the way this works is maybe you have on your glasses something projected. So if you're a surgeon and you're looking down, uh, what you might see is the um, uh, radiograph projected on top of the organ that you're about to uh, cut. Uh, or if you're um, um, uh, someone repairing something, you see a schematic overlaid on what you're actually seeing through your real glasses. And, and so this notion gets us even closer to sort of the real world. You don't, you don't need that metadata, that decoding, that stuff that, uh, that goes along with this to allow you to unpack it and get uh, um, the, the meaning out. And of course, the ultimate is the real life object. So, um, you know, the metadata basically you need for, for an inner, a, a real live experience with another human being is, hi, my name is Gary. And, you know, then we go from there, right? And already, we're, you know, you're making all sorts of inferences and, and uh, without even sort of knowing the name or hearing anybody speak, so that we're pretty good at this uh, without having to sort of have the descriptive stuff. Well, I'm a professor at the University of North Carolina. I mean, that tells you a lot, but you know that does, it, no one really needs that to actually get to know me pretty quickly. So, one way to think about these media is that um, they um, they have different kinds of characteristics. Um, the amount of effort or the requirements to create a representation. So, to compose text, 
you know, it's not something that, come, that you come born with. But to compose sound, you're kind of born with that. You know, you start crying pretty quickly a few seconds after, you know, birth, um, hopefully. And um, to create video, you can't create video. You need a device, right? There's some sort of requirement here. You need a camera. You need something that's going to take those frames in a fast enough um, action to make it look like uh, motion and record the quote reality. So the kinds of effort, either human effort or the kinds of requirements, the, uh, the equipment, software, hardware, um, um, skill needed is, is one of the characteristics of media. The other is the consumption effort. And we need a better word than this, but you know, what do you call reading a video, viewing a video, listening to an audio? You know, we need to start with some term. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, what seems to have been catching on in the sort of web community is this notion of consumption. Because you know, we consume a book, we consume a video, we consume a movie, we consume a song, um, we take it in somehow. And but the, the amount of effort required to consume something and the, re, the physical requirements, oh, I need a, I need a screen to, to view it, or I need some speakers to hear it, or I need light to read it, I need the columns and headings to actually understand it. You know, those are the sorts of, of uh, factors or characteristics that help us distinguish these different uh, uh, media. Um, there's also the notion of the actual transmission of those objects. And you know, what's required and how much effort does it take to get uh, your sound across. So you can scream at the, at the top of your lungs and reach a lot of people who are proximate. But you're not going to reach somebody 100 miles away. Um, this notion of how much effort or what kinds of help we need. I need an amplifier. If I only had a megaphone, or if I only had uh, a microphone and an amp, I could reach you know people all over the neighborhood. But I still can't go 100 miles. To go 100 miles, I need something else. I need a radio transmitter. I need some other kind of a requirement to uh, actually get to uh, my, um, my expression across. Uh, finally, and I've mentioned this uh, already, there's, there's descript description alternatives. And this, this is actually pretty important for information library science folks, because um, a lot of what we do is about uh, describing primary materials so that people can find them uh, in very large collections. Um, metadata and surrogates. I, I, I tend to sort of uh, distinguish these as the metadata are more um, machine readable, uh, they're um, um, maybe machine generatable, and the surrogates are actually for human consumption. Um, different uh, lecture, but um, uh, that's sort of one way to think about this. And some, some of these kinds of media require special kinds of metadata, special kinds of surrogation. So a lot of our research here and, and our, our video work uh, deals with um, creation of surrogates for video. Now, um, in the early days, people in this class had to read um, Warren Weaver's interpretation of Klein Shadow. Oh, you read it. Great. OK, good. Great. So. Um, then I'll go really quickly, because you all understand it totally, right? No. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, um, you know, I've been reading it and rereading it for most of my adult life, and it's still very noumenal. It comes and goes. So um, what Shannon uh, uh, approaches uh, is, is the technical problem of information. And, um, you know, he used a problem-solving strategy, which is basically simplify the problem, and then you can create a model, a mathematical model. And this is, this is done over and over again. It's what actually gets us uh, a lot of our human progress. Um, the unit of information of interest here is the bit, which is a corruption of binary digit. Uh, 
and it's the, the, the unit of choice or the uncertainty in the source. And I'll give you an example of this. I know it seems backwards, right, to, that information is a reduction in uncertainty. There's too many negatives there, but it actually helps in terms of formalizing the, the mathematics. Um, the rate of information flow, what we tend to think of as kind of the, um, uh, the throughput or bandwidth capability, and usually in bits per second, um, it's also called the entropy. And entropy comes from physics, um, uh, but here we, it really means how quickly you can reduce the uncertainty in someone's head. So uh, if you ask me a question and there's some uncertainty in your head, uh, there could, there's an enormous amount of uncertainty. If it's a question that's a binary case, yes or no, um, then as soon as I reply, I've completely reduced the uncertainty. If it's a wishy-washy reply, I've only reduced it somewhat. And that's what usually happens. Um, and then uh, the other thing uh, uh, Shannon was interested in was uh, channel capacity, the actual bandwidth, it, stuff you, how, how much you can get through a, a wire in, in this case. He worked for the phone company, right? A long time ago. So um, these were the basic kinds of, of issues he was trying to address. He proposed this model, which is now famous and everybody sort of, you know, uses. Uh, um, it may or may not be the right model. Certainly for the technical problem, this kind of works. You've got the information source and eventually have some destination, this receiver. Um, uh, uh, the, re the receiver in sort of decodes the, uh, so that the destination uh, can get it, whether that's a, you know, some sort of device or a human. Uh, there's some sort of transmitter that, uh, t that encodes the, uh, from the source the channel the medium through which this stuff uh, passes uh, is, is what uh, we would like to optimize. And the uh, part of the problem comes from noises. And, and uh, you know, I used to be able to use the analogy of the phone, or the squirrel running on the phone line when you dropped your bits uh, from your acoustical coupler modem. But in, uh, in today's uh, world, I don't know what the equivalent is. Uh, I guess maybe a, you know, a, a thunderstorm or something that you know, messes up your Wi-Fi. Um, so here's kind of the, the heart of, of, of the matter. It's not about the information that comes to you. It's, it's in reducing the, the number uh, of choices available in the source so from, the, from the, um, the sender. So um, we want to look at the source of the potential information, not the message itself. And this is usually where people get messed up because we are always thinking about the message. That's what I care about as a human, right? But from the sort of technical point of view, let's go out there and just talk about the source itself, what's possible uh, to send. So the, um, the uncertainty in the source is this amount of randomness or, or, en or, um, or ent uh, entropy. Here's the quote from Weaver. And, you know, he, he sort of ends with this, don't confuse information with meaning. As humans, we're concerned with the meaning part. And I want to come back to this in a, in a couple minutes. Um, but uh, the, the idea here is to focus just on this technical problem of understanding what's possible in the source and then how we can measure that so that we can optimize the throughput. So here's a, a, an example or two that I hope helped to explain this a bit. So, Let's say that you are going to give a party and you want RSVPs and all of your friends are very conscientious and are going to reply. Either yes or no. Not maybe or I don't know or I'm going to ignore this now. Uh, everyone's going to say yes or no. So the, the possibilities are you send this out, this, uh, this invitation to your party, and it's either yes I'm coming or no I'm not coming. So when I don't have it, my response from you yet, what I've got is some uncertainty. The amount of uncertainty I have is complete with respect to this problem. Now, as soon as, how many choices are there now? Two. Just two, right? Either you're coming or you're not coming. As soon as you tell me you're coming, I've now reduced my uncertainty. What, was, what were the possibilities I had? Yes, no. Yes, I had, no. yes, no. There were two. 
I've now reduced my uncertainty because I now have an answer. We would ca characterize this as saying that the amount of uncertainty or the amount of information is 0.5 because there were two possible choices. And so when I get the answer, I've now reduced the, my not knowing about you coming by half because I could have guessed. Right? Yes or no. But now I know, and so the difference between my guess, 50-50, and my certainty now, 100% you're coming to my party, is one half. Yeah? Sort of? Maybe? Got it. Good. Okay. Uh, here's a, here's a, maybe a little, little more robust uh, example. Let's suppose you want to create a visual language of icons for design, a uh, web design or something. And you're going to have say 32 icons in your uh, language. And so you're going to put these, these 32 different uh, icons up there and that's going to totally um, uh, re, uh, um, define the, the complete kinds of communications that can take place between the user and the system. This, you know, 32 is a lot. Uh, and in this case, if you want to do the sort of um, an analysis from the Shannon point of view, if there are 32 possibilities, and I now see it's, um, you know, the triangle shape, mm -hmm. I've now reduced my uncertainty by, how, by what portion? One, one, thirty-two. Well, thir 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 31, 30 seconds, actually, I've reduced okay. the uncertainty, right? I mean, yeah. I, I've now gotten rid of a lot of uncertainty mm -hmm. because there was this, a, a, a big range of, of stuff before, 32, I now have the answer. I've gone from one down to certain, uh, uh, to uh, the, well, from the one, one 32nd, which would have been my guess if I had just randomly picked one, to one, okay? So this is sort of the way it works. Uh, mathematically, this is kind of neat because um, if we talk about bits, which are these binary digits, we can use um, uh, base two logarithms, and this situation, with 32 icons is said to contain five bits of information. Because with 32 things, you can permute ones and zeros, uh, 30, uh, uh, 32 uh, in, with a, a string of five characters. Question, yeah. So, like e bytes, you get three choices. You get yes, no, and maybe. Right. So, how would that fit into your... Instead of uh, 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 instead of be, uh, being one, one half, I could guess one. My my chance of guessing would be one third, okay. right? And so once I get the response, I've now reduced my uncertainty by two thirds. But what if it's a maybe? Well, that that's I, I, I still don't know uh, for, for for sure. But in terms of the information system, the technical problem, I reduced it by two thirds because there were three possibilities. Okay, that's interesting. Whether you actually show up or not, well, that, that's a meaningful thing that I'll find out when, when you actually uh, come. So um, there's a whole bunch of um, assumptions here. It assumes that each choice is independent. Of course, we know in the real world that this is way too simple. That's what I said earlier. He simplified the problem just you know, so we could build this mathematical model. He, he then did the work to build much more robust kinds of schemas. But the, this was the basic idea here. Um, this led him to think about the problem of, well, what if you had more than one choice? Like, you're going to send a bunch of texts through the wires or a phone conversation through the wires. And, well, if you know that one word or one character has, has uh, been sent, then you can probably make some prediction about the next one and save some bandwidth. Reduce the amount of entropy that is there for the next character or the next word coming down. So the, the, the example in English that, that we always use is if you know that a Q has been sent and the last and the next thing is not a blank, then there's no information, no new information. You're not reducing your uncertainty by any by sending the next bit. So you maybe just skip it in the actual system. Now when you display it on the user side, you probably want to put the U that comes after it. But as far as the system is concerned, it's for sure going to be a U. 
So Shannon invented coding theory back in the 30s. Uh, and a lot of the compression stuff uh, that we do today is dependent on some of his work. So that was a, just a whole separate sort of um, um, contribution there. Okay, moving more quickly. Um, let's switch gears now. That was the Shannon, the technical problem of information. Very different way to think about information than we as humans think about it. If we switch to the other side and say, what about me? What about you? What about us as, as human beings? Then we... We think of information and we consume information and work with information in different ways. So we have what I think I would like to call over time the development of a personal information infrastructure. That's a great sort of inflated um, um, term. Uh, infrastructures are important nowadays, right? It's a, it's a good buzz term. So um, our PI, or PII, um, is uh, a collection of things. It's our understandings of the world. We have mental models for all sorts of things. Systems, people, information resources, events that have taken place and we recall the experiences we've had, domains of knowledge. So it's, it's, it's all the stuff that we learn. Right? This is part of our personal information uh, uh, infrastructure. We've got general cognitive skills. You know, we know how to think, we know how to do problem solving and make inferences and so on. Um, we have organization and uh, accessing tools uh, and skills that we learn over time. And in fact, in this field, these become extremely important because they're, they're not uh, meant to just be sort of the ordinary um, uh, personal life ones, but very large scale institutional kinds of, of um, filing and, uh, uh, and, and reading kinds of skills. Um, we've got material resources. Uh, these, uh, these might be our own information systems, our, our monetary resources to access and pay for information, and our time. And one of the reasons that people hire librarians and information professionals is because they, are, they want somebody else to take their time to acquire, manage, compile, process information. Uh, and we've got meta metacognitive kinds of resources. We plan, we monitor. You know, we, we pay attention to what we're doing as we go along. One of the interesting problems in search today is uh, we have a hard time studying how people search because all we're doing is collecting their click streams and getting these little snapshots. That's what all the search engines are doing. Uh, but to really understand the search process, you know, you need to get into, inside people's heads and that's very hard to do. Um, we also have attitudes, and so part of our personal information infrastructure is about attitudes. Attitudes about information, about information seeking, about search, and about knowledge acquisition. I mean, you're all in graduate school, so you're like totally over the top when it comes to having a positive attitude about learning. But, you know, that's not universal. And uh, we sort of have to sometimes uh, step back and, and remember that when we're working with people who maybe are not quite so passionate about knowledge acquisition and seeking information as we are. So, it seems to me that the sweet spot for this field, or a sweet spot for this field, is to be the bridge between the Shannon-like technical communication and information issues. How do we actually build better systems? How do we get um, uh, more, more robust, more powerful, uh, cheaper, uh, more efficient, effective kinds of information systems. And the human side, how do we actually learn better? How do we think better? How do we actually um, uh, enrich people's lives with information and hopefully knowledge so that they can achieve wisdom maybe uh, on their own? Uh, and that's really, I think, what this class is about, is to sort of begin to, you know, give some definitions that allow us to work toward that aim or that goal of bridging this gap. And you know, we have to know about the technical stuff uh, so that uh, we can understand what the engineers are doing and help guide the engineers and tell them what to do. And we have to understand the human side so we can understand the needs uh, and, and, and better meet the uh, those needs uh, uh, through our um, pr professional lives. Uh, and so that's why it seems to me that infor human information interaction is a core course here and um, uh, why it continues to be and how it's going to continue to evolve 
uh, in the years ahead because it sort of sits at this intersection between this uh, technical and uh, human side of information. Okay, questions? Are you gonna um, put that on our site? Yeah, I like that last page, yeah. that last slide. You like the last slide? Is that available <laughs> to our professors that we could have it? Sure. I'll, uh, actually, I'll put it up. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you. Yeah. The PowerPoint yeah. yeah, it's it, it's available in various forms and other places. But yeah. Okay. Yes. I have a question, not so much dealing with uh, human information interactions, but sort of after reading the first three chapters, your understanding of technology sort of. Um, so we have this very generalized understanding of technology as being beneficial. It sort of broadens horizons to no limit, right? Sort of the wider technology, the, the greater amount of technology that we have at our fingertips to connect expands information and communication. How do you feel about sort of technology that? attempts to constrain how that information is communicated. Like data mining, for example, you talked about sort of uh, cataloging people's search queries and things like that and how you can uh, sort of reverse engineer people's identities back from that. How do you feel about sort of uh, that type of communication and that type of technology being used then to limit people's access to information and to, I don't know, I mean, it, it seems I'm to definitely be... definitely not for it. Well, no, I understand, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah, it's yeah. really, it gets really confusing where the role of technology comes into as being beneficial or constraining or broadening and sort of limiting is how do we understand that within a framework of information scientists and library scientists as agents for change and how do we promote an information environment that seeks to always be promoting the breadth of technology to increase both the communication and information exchange. I, I guess I, I'm, I wouldn't promote the technology as much as I would open information. Okay. Um, the technology is a tool. Technology is really sort of value free. I mean, it, the values come from the humans that create it and that use it, especially. So, um, I like like anything we invent. Uh, technology can be uh, uh, used wisely or not, and uh, knowing the way the world works and and the human experience, I think we can expect that uh, there will be plenty of both. Uh, what um, to, to answer your question about what we can do as information professionals uh, to to um, uh, sort of be positive. I think argue for open access. Um, um, uh, uh, try and um, um, make the level of understanding of, of people about the not, not only the uses of information, but how other people are are abusing it or using it to their detriment. I mean, you know, it's an educational mission uh, to some degree, but it's also a political mission. Uh, and and. Um, uh, we, we have to use our voices uh, to uh, argue, I think, for openness. Uh, the, I mean, the alternative, and, and this is a very tough uh, discussion uh, to have, uh, information about, uh, let's say, how to make a cheap bomb or biological agent that could kill lots of people right. is a problem for us. Because if you go, if you say, theoretically, if all information should be open, well, but there's some information that um, you probably don't want to be open. And in fact, that's what classified means. And, and so there's a pretty clear distinction when something is actually made to be classified. The problem is now we have these m more blurred sort of um, um, things like sensitive or other terms that are, 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 are kind of problematic. I, don't, I think we, we do, we, we have leaders, decision makers, hopefully some of you, who will actually make decisions about what should be classified. So if someone comes into your library and says, uh, you know, I'd like information about um, uh, abortions or um, making, a, uh, making a bomb or how to grow better marijuana or 
you know, you have to make a decision. Some of that will be driven by your policies, some of it may be driven by uh, your, your actual problem solving ability at the, at the time, some of it will be driven by law. Uh, you need to be aware of those things, I mean, that's why we're information professionals, to sort of work on those boundaries. Those are the hard, hard things for us to do. Here did, the, 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 did the um, boundaries come up because of the Freedom of Information Act? Um, With the classified and sensitive? And this, uh, there were certainly classification, classified uh, things way, way before the Freedom of Information I mean, FOIA was only, what, the 60s, I think? And, and so um, uh, there were lots of classified things before that. Mm -hmm. This is not a new concept. Um, it, the, the Freedom of Information Act it, it does begin to um, uh, have implications here and, and because it's a way for us in this particular country to perhaps um, appeal yeah. and, and get access to things. But this is a much broader issue that's been around a long time. Okay. I work at a public library, and we're pretty laissez fair about what people want to know about. We don't really get involved in whether they want to build bombs or grow better marijuana plants. We just get them the information that they seek. So I'm not really sure that I feel like, I mean, I think I would be more concerned about what they wanted to know about the water supply or something like that, you know. <laughs> but, like, if they want to learn how to build a cherry bomb and blow it up in their elementary school, I mean, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Kids are going to be kids. But, I mean, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, um. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I just, I don't know. People, I mean, you know. So, I mean, this, yeah, this. And there are, there are professional standards that suggest in libraries that the intermediary not transmit their particular value system or really enact their particular value system when they're helping people. But how far does it go? That's the ethical we question. Can't, I mean, we can't, I mean, that's in our policy. We cannot tell a child they can't check out, say, right. the joy of sex. I mean, we can't do that. That's for their parents to, like, legislate that. That's not our job, you know? So... I mean, I feel like, you know, if you ask about the water supply, that's one thing. But if you ask about, hey, right. some information on a cherry bomb, I'm not going to be like, sure. No. You know what I'm saying? So but you set up your own boundaries based right. on your value system, based on your, your personal information architecture or infrastructure mm -hmm. um, when you're acting as a professional. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, part, to me at least, part of being a professional is that you've acquired information you have turn that information into knowledge, and then you are making knowledgeable decisions. Mm -hmm. um, that's, in a way, what they pay you for, partially. Exercise judgment. Absolutely. One last one, and then um, I know you have to, you're going to do the anomalous states of knowledge, and that's a fascinating discussion. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that uh, you, in your definition of communication, you excluded uh, computers or machines. I was wondering. Yeah. You could say a little bit about why that, why that is. Um, well, just to, to make a sharper boundary between communication uh, and uh, interaction, really. Uh, that um, the, I don't really think you communicate with a computer or with a machine. Uh, you know, I you know I call my car names all the time, <laughs> or, uh, and, uh, but I don't think that's communication. So uh, what I'm trying to do is actually sort of I guess um, put a human face on communication. Kind of legal place for interaction. Yeah, to, to actually to try to create some of the boundaries that so we can talk about these things uh, um, in a reasonable way. You know, is that the official definition of communication that the you know some professional society would give? Probably not. We used to call it human computer communication, uh, and you know that just never kind of made it to me. I mean, human computer interaction is a lot better, but it's still kind of weird. You have a question? Another question? Uh, no, I was just going to make a comment. Um, yes, you have standards, but at the same time, you've got to make information available to everyone, and it's just, again, it's judgment calls. And to be able to, um, you know, reach people, you need to be able to speak their language. Mm -hmm. To be able to educate them. I was wondering if we might, we've been talking in class about the concept of noise, mm -hmm. and I've been maintaining that noise can be thought of as a positive, in a positive form. Um, we're not sure about that, though. 
I wondered if you would tell us a little bit about your idea of noise or what noise does. In, in the Shannon sense, noise is bad. I mean, you try to minimize it, avoid it, get rid of it, filter it out. That you know that so it's clean, clear, and cut. Right. In the real world, of course, noise is quite good. If you don't want in a busy sort of place to hear it will be overheard, you know, you go to a noisy place so that uh, you know it acts as a filter. Um, uh, the Paul Dorish, who um, writes a lot about sort of social networking and, and, and uh, sociology of computation, uh, he talks about uh, um, strangers mm -hmm. and. If you wouldn't have an identity if there weren't any strangers, and so um, you know you, you need and so like I think it's like that with noise. I mean, noise might be the background that allows you to see the foreground, mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know if you want to be gestaltist about it, that's an important thing. So yeah, I think there can be some positive aspects of noise from the human side, but from the Shannon side, it's just bad. You know, we want to get rid of it, minimize it. Well, enjoy Belkin. Okay.